Okay, so today we're going to continue with our treatment of political parties. And um, if you watch the videos that I linked up for you for the Tuesday class session, you'll know it was a little bit different uh, for that Tuesday class session than it has been because um, there are actually three different links there. One is to some comments that I made, uh, three or four minutes of comments that I made. And then the second one is to a uh, talk given by University of Houston professor uh, Richard Murray uh, about 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago, but actually going on 12 years ago now, uh, in which he makes some observations about the possibilities of the Democratic Party re-emerging in Texas as a competitive force in the state's politics. He makes some predictions. Um, I hope you had a chance to watch that. And then the third piece is, uh, or the third link is to the part of the class session from Tuesday where we kind of had our own discussion in that Tuesday class session about some of Professor Murray's comments, okay? And as usual, therefore, I'm gonna just sort of pick up here in today's class session, this Thursday class session, uh, as if you have seen those segments, okay? But let me give you an opportunity to ask questions if you have them, since it was a little bit different than what you were used to in the previous weeks, particularly that part from Professor Murray. Any questions about any of the points that he makes, any of the projections that he makes? Um, yeah. He said that there was gonna be three or more in Texas? No, I don't think I ever heard him say that. Anybody else hear him say that? I didn't hear him say that. Yeah. Did you heard him say that? I must have been okay, yeah, I no. I thought the prediction was that there would be more political parties. No, I mean, look, in America, we're going to talk about this, this actually, this little point here a little bit in today's class session. We talk about the American system, Texas is part of the American system, right? We talk about the American party system being a dominant two party system. But that doesn't mean that we don't have other political parties, right? I mean, that we have, we call them in the American system, we call them minor parties or third parties. And there's a reason for that, which we'll get to in today's class session. But no, that wasn't the subject of his talk. The subject of his talk was the fact that we have had in Texas historically a one party state. Texas has historically been a one party state. Now, for many, many, many decades, that meant one party democratic dominance, okay? And about the midnight, about the mid to late 1970s into the 1980s, we began seeing a real change in Texas politics. Now, at the time that you know, many of my colleagues, many political scientists here in Texas uh, and elsewhere around the country, observing what's going on in Texas, were saying, "Well, uh, it looks like Texas is becoming a competitive two-party state." But as it turned out, it really wasn't becoming a competitive two-party state. I mean, we had during the 1970s and the 1980s, the reason that they said that, by the way, the reason that that was the conclusion was because you had both Democrats and Republicans being elected in, in, in elections in Texas in that time. But it was really very short-sighted to say that Texas was becoming a two-party state because it was really just a transition. It was a transition from one-party Democratic dominance to one-party Republican dominance. And it's been pretty clear that since 1994, Texas has been a one party Republican state. And so the subject of Professor Murray's talk a decade ago, or actually over a decade ago now, was the prospects of the Democratic Party reemerging in Texas, not to become the dominant party, but to become a competitive force. So that Texas, will Texas become a truly competitive two party state? And he lays out some trends that he thinks are relevant and what he thinks might happen over the decade to come. He's giving this talk in 2010. So he's laying out what he thinks is going to happen in the 2000 teens, this decade that you know was most recently concluded. And he may even make some predictions about what we should see by 2014, what we should see by 2016 or 2018, right? And part of my purpose in sharing his talk with you is so that we could kind of assess not to not the purpose here is not to be able to say hey professor murray was right on the money or professor murray was way off the mark that's not the purpose the i think he says some things in his talk that give us a basis for for thinking about what's happening in texas politics 
currently what's happened over the last 10 years and what might happen over the next 10 years. Okay. So that was my, that was my purpose in sharing that. Now, what did, what did you come away with? Like what, um, he's not saying that there's going to be multiple parties in Texas, but he does say what does it, did anybody come away with something else? While you're thinking about that, let me do this real quick. So let me suggest to you kind of the broader context of Professor Murray's comments. So most people who study the Texas political system including the authors of your textbook, agree that we have gone through several different party eras, okay? In fact, the way that I've laid it out here on the uh, screen is, I think, pretty consistent with the way that the authors of your textbook laid out, okay? The first party era runs from 1836. What's key about 1836? What happened in 1836? Very important thing happened in Texas history in 1836. Texas independence from Mexico. Okay. Of course, Texas became part of the United States in 1845. But so this period that we're talking about here in the early and middle part of the 19th century coincides with the emergence of the mass membership party system. And again, we're going to talk about what that means here in today's class meeting, but you know, you had in American politics more generally, you had the emergence of the, what we think of as the modern party system in the United States, okay? And in the South, the Democratic Party was dominant, and Texas, consistent with that, had one party dominance, okay? So even before Texas became a state in the United States, when it was the period when it was a, a republic, you had that Democratic Party dominance in Texas, and then up to the Civil War. Now, what, obviously, after the Civil War, during the Reconstruction period, what happened? Something we've, we've talked about previously in this class. Right? What happened as a result of the end of the Civil War and Reconstruction in Texas? That spelled the end, at least for a period of time, of Democratic Party dominance. Remember we said that in re, during the Reconstruction period, former Confederates were disenfranchised and prohibited from holding public office. Okay? So that meant that you had a period of time there, particularly like 1869 to 1875, where the Republican Party was the dominant party. It was the party of Texas, right? The governor was Republican. The legislature was controlled by Republicans. But it was largely because traditional Democrats in Texas couldn't participate. But Reconstruction comes to an end in 1875, and they write a new constitution. And we talked about all that story. And so you have the reemergence of the dominant Democratic Party, you know, the dominant Democratic Party power structure. Okay. So during this first party era, um, when we talk about Democratic Party dominance, we're talking about white Southern Texans who uh, are very conservative. Okay? Uh, in the latter part of the 19th century, as we get down to the 18 you know, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, we talk about uh, we talk about the emergence of some very powerful landowners and industrialists in Texas. I mean, it was happening uh, elsewhere across the country, but you know, specifically in Texas, who were very conservative and who favored low taxes and very minimal government regulation, sort of a laissez-faire approach to economic policy, and um, of course, were segregationists. By the 1930s, we have a new sort of factionalism emerging in Texas politics in the Democratic Party. We see the emergence of an identifiable liberal faction, a progressive faction of the Democratic Party in Texas. I'm not suggesting to you that it became the dominant faction in the Democratic Party in Texas, but at least identifiable, okay, coinciding with the um, emergence of, a, of, a, of the Roosevelt coalition of the Democratic Party 
nationally. Right? This is the period of the New Deal, right? And so you have people like, I guess, one notable name that you would probably recognize that was part of this new faction in the Democratic Party was Lyndon Johnson. He was a Roosevelt Democrat, a New Deal Democrat, first elected to Congress in the 1930s. Right? But as I said, it, it's never it was the dominant faction of the Texas Democratic Party. It was still, you know, the conservative faction of the Democratic Party still, um, you know, controlled things. But you at least had this identifiable liberal faction. And then we move into this third party era in the middle part of the 20th century, where you have liberal Democrats continuing to gain ground. Um, the name Ralph Yarbrough was important, a uh, U.S. Senator from Texas, uh, who was part of this liberal faction and had considerable influence. This is the period, remember, we've talked about very recently where voting rights barriers are coming down. The white primary comes to an end in, in 1944. The poll tax comes down in the mid 1960s. The Voting Rights Act is passed in 1965. And so you have all these new voters who become active in the Texas Democratic Party and that enhances the stature of the liberal faction. You also have the emergence in this period of a um, Republican Party that's making inroads. It's again not going to be the dominant party, but you at least start having Republicans that are elected to office in Texas. For you know, 80 years, Republicans just couldn't get elected to office in Texas. But beginning with John Tower, elected to the United States Senate in 1960, and he was successful in being reelected a number of times over the ensuing years. Okay, uh, you have the emergence of this uh, of this. A Republican Party that is um, gaining ground in Texas. And in fact, by the 1950s, Texans in voting for the presidency clear, pretty clearly have a preference for Republican candidates. In both 1952 and 1956, a majority of Texans voted for Dwight Eisenhower, the Republican candidate. And in 1964, of course, they voted for Lyndon Johnson. Uh, but in 1960, uh, Texans, um, it was very close in Texas between Richard Nixon and uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, and then uh, the last time Democrats ever, a majority of Texans voters, in, uh, a majority of voters in Texas ever voted for a Democratic candidate for president was 1976, when they, a majority of Texans voted for, for uh, Jimmy Carter. So at the national level, we see the Republicans really gaining ground in Texas but at the state level as well during this period. Right? In the fourth party era, we see at the time, again, as I, as I suggested a little bit, you know, a few minutes ago, um, you know, the, I, I first walked into a college classroom as a faculty member during this period, the 1980s. And in those days, we used to talk about <laughs> there being three identif identifiable factions of both of the major political parties. Believe it or not, we used to talk about something called a liberal Democrat, a moderate Democrat, and a conservative Democrat. There was a such thing as a conservative Democrat, right? And we used to talk about liberal, moderate, and conservative Republicans. We don't do that really anymore. You don't, certainly in the media, you don't hear many people talking about conservative Democrats or liberal Republicans anymore. I think, you know, today's politics appears to be much more, the parties appear to be much more aligned along ideological grounds with the conservative party being, excuse me, the Republican party being conservative and the Democratic party being liberal. But in those days, we identified, you know, both of the parties, both the Democratic party and the Republican party as having these identifiable factions. Well, in Texas in particular, because Republicans were increasingly being elected to office, Bill Clements, for example, was the first Republican elected governor in 1978, the first Republican elected governor since Reconstruction in 100 years, almost 100 years. So a lot of observers began to argue that Texas was moving into a period of two-party competition. But as I suggested a few minutes, you know, earlier, that that was probably premature because what really we know now what was really happening it was just transitioning from one party democratic dominance to one party republican dominance in fact it was many of the same people right many of 
people who had formerly been Democrats, conservative Democrats, were jumping over to the Republican Party, in part because of the personal magnetism of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> he had a lot of appeal to conservative Democrats in Texas and in the South more generally, but he was just a more general phenomenon. A lot of conservative Democrats began to reach the conclusion that the National Democratic Party was no longer, they were no longer philosophically in tune. And so they moved over to the Republican Party. Names that you might even recognize. Rick Perry, for example. Did you know that Rick Perry, former Governor Perry, who was governor before, immediately before the current governor, Greg Abbott. Greg Abbott, of course, was a Republican. And when Rick Perry was elected governor of Texas, he was a Republican. But when he started his political career, when he was first elected to public office, he was a Democrat. He was one of those conservative Democrats that moved over in the 1980s to the Republican Party. Former U.S. Senator from Texas, Phil Graham, elected to the United States Senate as a Republican in 1984. But prior to that, he had served in the United States House of Representatives. He was a Democrat from College Station. And Phil Graham, like so many other conservative Republicans, just says, the Democratic Party is out of step with the values of my constituents, the, the values that people in College Station hold. And so I'm moving over to the Republican Party because that's more consistent with where my voters are. So that was happening in Texas, many, many names that we can mention, but it was also happening elsewhere across the South. All right, so this transition from one party Democratic dominance to one party Republican dominance involved many of the same people. It's still conservative. Okay, um, during this period, you also have another phenomenon that's happening in Texas and more generally in the South that leads to uh, Republican Party dominance, and that is you have migrations of people from other parts of the country who are mainly um, professional, white professionals, right? white collar professionals who came from places like Ohio and Michigan and you know other places in the Midwest, upper Midwest, where they had been Republicans. And they come to Texas, and of course, they're still Republicans, and that helps build the Republican Party as well. And then I think the last thing that I can mention here is that during this period, we're getting far enough from the Reconstruction experience 100 years prior that for most Texans, that um, knee jerk reaction to voting Republican is just sufficiently faded away. You know, there was a long period in Texas where Democrats, we used to call them, I don't, I may have mentioned this to you all in a previous class meeting. I can't remember what, what class it came up in, but have you, did I mention to you or have you ever heard the term yellow dog Democrat? We used to, Democrats in Texas, particularly East Texas, we used to refer to them as yellow dog Democrats. The suggestion was that the thought of voting for a Republican was so horrifying to them, so repugnant to them that they would vote for a yellow dog before they would vote for a Republican. We don't have those people anymore. In fact, they're probably yellow dog Republicans, although we don't use that term. All right, so this is a very important period, this fourth party era where we see this transition. The fifth party era, which we're currently in, is one that really began with the election of George W. Bush as governor. Um, it's pretty clear that Texas is a you know one party state by this time. In fact, 1994 was the last year that any Democrat was elected to a statewide office in Texas. You had two Democrats elected in, in that election in 1994. Uh, the attorney general was a guy by the name of Dan Morales and the treasurer uh, was a woman named Martha Whitehead. And I think the only reason Martha Whitehead won her office, won her race, is because she was a one-issue candidate. And she promised Texans that they voted for her for state treasurer. Her number one objective would be to work for the abolishment, for abolishing the office of state treasurer. <laughs> and, you know, if you are a politician and you're running on a platform of abolishing the very office that you're running for, that's got to get you votes, right? And the office of state treasurer was abolished under her watch. At any rate, Dan Morales is really the last Democrat of consequence that was elected to statewide office, and that was the Attorney General's office. We haven't had a governor 
a Democrat elected governor in Texas since 1991 when um, uh, Ann Richards, 1990, I should say, 1990 was the election when Ann Richards was elected governor. And she was a very popular governor. You know, she had very high ratings, public approval ratings, even when she was running for re-election. The problem was she was running against George W. Bush. And George W. Bush beat her in her re-election effort. So we haven't had a, a governor, a Democratic governor in a long time in Texas. What will happen in 2022? Will Beto O'Rourke be a credible competitive candidate against um, um, the incumbent Greg Abbott? We'll see. You know, we just kind of have to see how those things play out. I'm skeptical. We'll see how that plays out. Okay, so that's really brings us to the sixth party era, which was the subject of, he didn't call it a sixth party era, but that's what he's talking about. Is Texas moving into a period, a new era, where we have two party competition? And just have any of his predictions panned out over the last 10 years? What, here, does anybody remember any of the predictions he made? Did you watch his, his talk? I mean, yes or no? I mean, it's just, if you didn't, I'll leave it alone. Oh, that anything that he covered in that talk is, uh, subject to quizzing on the lecture. For like the, this week's oh, gotcha. And then next week gotcha. Once you've taken the lecture quiz, then you go back and watch it. Gotcha. That's okay. a good question. Well, don't forget it. Don't forget to go back and look at it. Yeah. The, the two big classes, can we be tested about it on a, on a monitor like this? Oh, the Tuesday classes that we watch, we can be tested on it. We can't be tested no, on it. No, we can, but like, it's not in the same way. Like, the class this year that we talked about the, in the next lecture. One of the things I assume, and maybe I'm wrong about this, is you would like to have some time to study <laughs> for quizzes, right? So I don't want to give you a quiz on Thursday based on material that was covered in the Tuesday class session because you really haven't had an opportunity to study. Not much of an opportunity to study. Well, when you do watch it, okay? Pay attention to the observations that he makes about the trends, right, in the population, trends in the voting, the general population, trends in the voting population. Also pay attention to uh, what he refers to as the top-down strategy, or what I refer to, I don't think he uses that term, but I'm referring to it as his top-down strategy, okay, versus his bottom-up strategy. In other words, he's talking about how the Democrats might approach or what they might need to do in order to become a competitive. He's not a cheerleader for the Democratic Party. I, I think that we're, I, I, can, I can rest pretty comfortably and tell you he's not, even though he identifies himself at the start of his talk as a moderate Democrat, okay? I, I take him at his word that he's not arguing that rah, 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 hey, let's get the Democrats back because we need the Democrats. What he's, at, what he's suggesting is that uh, we need a competitive system in Texas, that competition is healthy in politics. And we haven't had that very much for very long in Texas. And he's talking about the prospects that that might happen over the decade to come. Now, we've concluded that decade. And so he makes some rather specific predictions about what you might see by 2014, what you might see by 2016, what you might see by 2018. So pay attention to those predictions and, you know, how did that, how did it pan out? <clears throat> okay. Let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, because we do have other things that we need to talk about. Uh, I want to talk in, um, more theoretical terms in some ways, more general terms about political parties, what they are, what they do. Um, and I want to begin by sharing with you a couple of passages from uh, a couple of scholars in the field. Th this is not gonna be up here long enough for you to transcribe. So please don't try, okay? You'll be frustrated if you do because I'll take it down before you have a chance to get it all, okay? But we're gonna have an opportunity to sort of summarize the points made here by Professor Burnham and Professor Sorrell. Okay, so this first passage is from a book 
titled The End of American Party Politics, written by the eminent Dr. Walter Dean Burnham. There you see, I thought I had a picture of him on here. Uh, I, I don't know what happened to it. At any rate, uh, Dr. Burnham was uh, for many years on the faculty at the University of Texas at Austin. He's one of the one of my profession's most highly respected scholars in this area. Okay, so here's what he writes. He says, political parties with all their well-known human and structural shortcomings are the only devices thus far invented by the wit of Western man that can with some effectiveness generate countervailing collective power on behalf of the many who are individually powerless against the relatively few who are individually or organizationally powerful. Their disappearance, the political party's disappearance as active intermediaries would only entail the ascendancy of the already powerful. And here's a passage from Dr. Frank Soff, who is also a very highly respected scholar of American politics, from his book called Party Politics in America. He writes, the American parties and all others for that matter, mobilize sheer numbers against organized minorities with other political resources. And I've inserted in the parentheses there, most notably economic resources, because that's exactly what he's talking about. Now, you can read the book yourself and get that, or you can take my word for it if you don't read the book. That's what he's talking about, economic resources, okay? Money. And they do so in the one avenue of political action in which sheer numbers of individuals count most heavily, elections. Thus, the parties have classically been the mechanism by which newly enfranchised and powerless electorates have risen to power. And in more fluid politics with a large number of organization, political organizations, again, I've inserted interest groups there because that's what he's talking about, and millions more uncommitted or independent voters, the fear is that the advantage will be on the side of well-organized minorities with other political resources. The political party is the or political organization of the masses who lack the cues and information, as well as the political resources of status, skills, and money to make a major impact on public decisions via other means. Now, that's a lot of verbiage. You know, I hope you were reading along with me, paying attention. You could glean uh, something out of those two passages. So let me let me start by asking you this. Are Soft and Burnham saying the same thing or are they saying something significantly different? Are Burnham and Soft saying something different? Are they are there are their thoughts here sort of in competition with one another or are they essentially saying the same thing? Saying the same thing? Yeah, I think that's I think they are essentially saying the same thing. Okay. So what is it that they're saying? Well, let's see if we can break it down a little bit. Okay. I'm gonna try to summarize what both of these guys are saying in a three interrelated ideas. Okay, three interrelated propositions. First of all, where democracy exists in modern political systems, there are also strong vital competitive party systems. If we look around the world today, if we had a map of the world in here. We don't have one. Oh yeah, there is one right over there, right? Not very, not very big. <laughs> we have a wall-sized map, right? We would find if we look at the countries on that map and we identify countries that are democracies, and objectively speaking, we can call democracies. And those that, in fact, we we just make two lists up here on the board. I'm not going to do it. Okay, because I never can find a marker that works very well. <laughs> but imagine I've a heading that says democratic countries over here. And I go over there to the other side and I make a list that says not democracies or not democratic countries. Okay, and we just start picking. In fact, I, I, I have a dart. You give them Martin a touch. They throw your dart at the map, right? And it hit, let's say it hits a land map and it hits. It hits Canada. And I say to Martin, Martin, I don't know how much, if anything, you know about the Canadian system. But to whatever extent you know something, or if you just want to guess, can we objectively say that Canada is a democracy? Okay. I think that almost every political scientist that is you know, 
doesn't have an agenda. <laughs> right? I would agree with you. Yeah, Canada is the most. So we're going to put Canada on that list. Okay. And then we come over here to. Um, What's your first name? Barbara. Barbara. Yeah, that's what I thought. I started to say it and then I, I cleared up. Barbara. And she takes her throat, right? And it hits uh, Australia. And I say, Barbara, I don't know how much you know about Australian politics, but is Australia a democracy? And she says, yeah, Australia is a democracy. And then I go over to Chan, and he takes his throw, and it hits Japan. Everybody's steering clear of the oceans, right? It hits Japan. I say, hey, I don't know how much you know about the Japanese political system, but would you say Japan is a democracy? You got a couple of classmates who are trying to push you in one direction. Yeah, Japan is a democracy. I think you know, political scientists would agree. Japan is a democracy. And someone hits Israel. Is Israel a democracy? Yeah, Israel is a democracy. Is India, somebody hits India. Is India a democracy? Yeah, India is a democracy. Someone hits the United Kingdom. Is the United Kingdom a democracy? Yeah, the United Kingdom is a democracy. France, Germany, right? And we make this list and we fill up all this board space here under this heading that says, democracies, all these countries that we've just mentioned, objectively speaking, we can say are democracies. But then somebody hits the People's Republic of China. And I come over here and I start to write PRC and somebody says, hold on a second, wait, you don't want to put China on that list. You want to put China over here on this list, right? China is not a democracy. It's an authoritarian system. Right? Somebody else hits Russia. So we're going to put Russia. We put Russia over here under non-democratic country. Okay. North Korea. We're going to put it over here, not democratic. Cuba. Right. And so we get a similar list, right? We have countries over here that are democracies, and we have countries over here that are not democracies. And now I go back to Martin. I say, hey, Martin, uh, does Canada have a competitive party? We've said that Canada is a democracy. Does it have a competitive party system? Yeah, it does have a competitive party system. And how about the United Kingdom? Whoever hit the United Kingdom, does it have a, yeah, it has a competitive party system. How about Japan? Does it have a competitive party? Yeah, it has a competitive party system. How about Australia? Does it have a, Germany, France, Israel, India? Do all those countries have competitive party systems? Yes, they all have competitive party systems. How about China? No, it has a one party communist party dictatorship. How about North Korea? No, one party communist party dictatorship, Cuba. Right? No, uh, Russia, right, doesn't have a competitive party system. Right? All of these countries that go on this list, we're going to find that what they all have in common is that they don't have competitive party systems. The countries on this list over here, under the heading democracies, they all have competitive party systems. Right? So that's what this one is suggesting that where we have democracy in modern political systems, we also have competitive party systems. But you know what? I think Barnum and Soroff would both say, yeah, Fagan, but it's not a coincidence. It's not just something that happened to play out that way. In fact, what they're telling us in just those quotes that I read to you is that, in fact, it is the emergence of competitive party systems and modern political systems that facilitate the development of democracy. That there's sort of a causal thing going on here. That party systems emerge as the vehicle or as the mechanism in order to facilitate democratic government. You can also make that point historically. If I was to ask you, in what country did modern mass participatory democracy first emerge? And when? Anybody want to take a guess at that? Probably wouldn't point to Great Britain, right? Modern mass, particip mass participatory democracy, where sort of ordinary citizens first really became involved in the political process. How about the United States? And when are we talking about? Remember, we've actually alluded to this previously during that period that historians refer to as the Jacksonian era, right? So in the early part of the 19th century, 1820s, 1830s. And by the way, in what country did political parties, as we think of them today, I'm going to make a distinction here between two different types of party systems in a few minutes, but just for now, just as we think of political parties today, in what country did they first emerge? 
and when? The United States, in the same period, the Jacksonian period, where we have the emergence of mass membership party systems that we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Okay? So as, that happens in the United States first in the early to middle part of the 19th century. Europe in the latter part of the 19th century. By the time we get to the 20th century, you have the spread of democracy to other parts of the world and in the form of competitive party systems. Number two, both Burnham and Saroff seem to be suggesting to us that in recent history, in recent decades, the American parties, both of the two major parties, both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, seem to have lost control of, over many of their traditional functions. That is to say, the kind of democratic functions that political parties merged to carry out that something's going on in the American system that would seems to suggest that the parties really aren't controlling that process anymore. Parties aren't really in charge of that anymore to a large extent. So if we accept the first argument, if we accept the first premise, and I think we should, that political parties facilitate the development of democratic political systems. And if we accept whatever evidence Burnham and Soros offer in their books that the American parties are somehow losing control over their traditional functions, then that might cause us some concern for the quality of American democracy. If in fact the American parties are losing control over their traditional functions. If they're just not, if they're dysfunctional somehow, if they are in a state of decline or in a state of demise, however we might say that, they're somehow not performing these democratic functions that they emerge to perform, then that might give us pause to worry about the quality of American democracy moving forward. That it, might in fact produce ironic elitist consequences. So, for example, when Barnum says their disappearance, talking about the political parties, would only entail the ascendancy of the already powerful and Soroff says that the fear is that the advantage will be on the side of well-organized minorities with other political resources. What do they mean? Let me let me approach it a little bit different way. Okay, try to really drive this point home. I'm going to suggest a democratic model to you here. So we're going to start at the bottom and go upwards, right? Where the flow is going upwards. So you have, in, in some modern society, you have all these individuals. If we're talking about American society, you know. 350 million people or 290 million adults, whatever the you know, numbers that we want to use there. Okay. Lots of different people down here. And then you have these um, institutions like political parties and interest groups that emerge. And we're calling these input structures. Here you may recall the systems model usage that we introduced you to the in the very beginning of the semester. Remember, it's like ancient history now, right? We haven't really returned to the systems model since we first introduced it in that first week of classes. But you'll recall that you know the systems model suggests that these institutions emerge in modern societies to perform specific functions. Okay, and here you have the familiar legislative, executive, and judicial institutions of government. And then finally, you have the public policy decisions and actions that are made by government. And this is a democratic model, lowercase d, because the flow is moving upward, suggesting what? That somehow these policy decisions and actions that are made by government originate or somehow at least reflect the expectations, demands, and so on of these people down here at the bottom. OK, now, in, under this model, this very simple visual model that 
um, suggesting to you here, notice that political parties like interest groups, mass media, public, they're, they're, they occupy the same position. They're intermediaries, right? That's what, uh, that's what Burnham calls them, right? He says their disappearance is active intermediaries. Right? So that's kind of where they're positioned here, right? They're intermediaries between what? The otherwise politically disoriented, <laughs> politically powerless individual and the complex, distant, remote institutions of government lay up here. But we're specifically focusing on political parties. So let me so so in that sense, political parties and interest groups play the same general role. But political parties and interest groups, of course, have different concerns on an ongoing basis. So we're just going to take the others out of the picture and focus on political parties. Right? So you've got all the individuals down here, you've got the complex, distant, remote institutions of government up here, and you've got political parties in between. Right? Now here's what I think Burnham and Soft are suggesting that we think about. Let's take political parties out of the picture altogether. Okay? Their disappearance as active intermediaries. Right? So we made them disappear. Okay? So that all that we're left with are the individuals. I have a question for you. What can you do as an individual? And you have to make a, an, an honest assessment of things here, right? What can you do as an individual, acting alone, not in concert, in concert with any other individuals, that can realistically have an impact on the decisions made by government, the actions undertaken by government? Tell me one thing that you can do. Nobody has any thoughts? <clears throat> have any of you ever written to a public official, not as a high school civics assignment, but as a concerned citizen about something. Well, join, you're in good company because very few Americans ever do that. Now, why not? Why do you think most Americans don't do that? Do you think it's because they perceive it won't have any impact? Well, yeah, I think it is exactly because they perceive that. What, what difference is it gonna make? I'm just, you know, I'm nobody. On the other hand, can you give me the name of someone that we would all recognize that could send a written communication? Well, how about this? William Fagan gets on a plane and goes to Washington, D.C., goes into the office of one of the two United States senators from Texas. Anybody know who the two senators are? John Cornyn and Ted Cruz. So let's just say I go into John Cornyn's office swing the doors wide open and say, I need to see Senator Cornyn right now. <laughs> on a probability scale of zero to one, where zero means no chance on earth that I get to see Senator Cornyn, one meaning absolute certainty that I'm going to see Senator Cornyn, give me a probability. It's an absolute zero? Like there, what, if, what if Senator Cornyn just happens to be standing in the foyer? It can't be absolutely. Maybe it's what, as our mathematician friends would say, asymptotically approaching zero. It's about as close as you can get to zero without being zero, right? Not a good chance I'm going to get it. Can you give me the name of someone who could go into Senator Cornyn's office and say, I need to see the senator, who would probably at some point in the very near future get to see Senator Cornyn? By the way, they're going to be very polite to his staff. He's going to be very polite to me, I suspect. Now, who are you again? Where are you from? Oh, I'm, I'm from Texas. Well, can the staff member help you? Because Senator Cornyn is in a committee meeting right now. And, he, you know, chances are probably pretty good he is in a committee meeting right now, right? Or having some power lunch or something like that, right? But you understand what I'm saying. I'm probably not getting in to see Senator Cornyn unless it's just the most fortunate set of circumstances you can imagine. But can you give me the name of somebody who probably will get to see Senator Cornyn? Okay. Greg Abbott? That's probably going to be something they set up ahead of time, right? right? Other, other government officials. Okay, I buy that. Anybody who's not a government official? I mean, give, don't give me like offices or positions. Give me a name that we'll all recognize, a person's name. If William Fagan doesn't 
have that kind of clout? Who does? Nobody can. Who? Well, for the benefit of, does everybody know who Ben Shapiro is? Anybody know? Tell, tell your classmates who Ben Shapiro is. Like the side, so I'd like to talk to according to who you allow to. Maybe. Good. Anybody else? I was thinking you might jump on a real con obvious name like, say, you know, Jeff Bezos or something like that, right? I think Jeff Bezos, the probability of him getting to see, see Senator Corn is closer to one than zero. How about, um, you know, Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or, um, the Koch brothers. <laughs> you understand? Like you understand what I'm saying? In other words, when we're left to our own devices, the question of how much influence we really have can have, how much impact we can have on what government does, really comes down to a matter of how much personal influence we have, and that's probably a matter of what. That's probably a matter of this, right? And why Burnham says the ascendancy of the already powerful. You're going to have, in that kind of situation, in that kind of system, the people who are individually powerful or who are going to be able to have an impact on government are the people who are already powerful. They're just going to be that much more powerful. So in other words, what they're telling us is that political parties are a means by which they emerge in model, modern political systems as a means for those of us who are individually powerless to have an impact on what government does through collective action rather than individual action. Now, how are political parties different from interest groups, let's say? Well, political parties are really the only sorts of organizations in modern political systems that are capable of, certainly in the American system, but even um, interested in forming majority consensus. Interest, broad. Yes, interest groups are interested in building majority consensus for the sake of building majority consensus. Interest, I mean, you understand what I'm saying? Like interest groups, they're, they're mainly, their interest is what? The specific interest, right? Getting benefits for their members in whatever form those benefits come. And if that is consistent with majority consensus, great. Democracy is great. But if it's inconsistent with majority consensus, the hell with democracy. Right? I mean, there's a reason why we call them special interests. Okay? So political parties, Barnum and Swarth are telling us, are really the only sorts of institutions that we've developed, at least to this point, in democratic societies that are capable of building, forging majority consensus. Now, on what basis did they do that? Well, you can see I've sort of grouped these using the blue and red conventions that the journals people will apply to American politics, you know, blue for Democrat and red for Republican, right? But, you know, shades of blue and red, right? Because some Democrats are more Democrat than other Democrats, right? And some Republicans are more Republican than other Republicans. And then you've got the beige independents in the middle, right? So you got strong Democrats, moderate, you know, sort of uh, strong Democrats to sort of just leaning Democrat and leaning Republican to sort of strong Republican, okay? But the point is, is that these people are grouped together because at a, at a minimum, they share a basic philosophy about the role of government in our society, the kinds of things government ought to be doing and ought not be doing or even the kinds of economic programs that government should undertake or shouldn't undertake, right? Whether there should be more regulation or less regulation, right? That's got, so you're gonna get a lot of agreement among Democrats on basic philosophy and a lot of agreement among Republicans on basic philosophy, but even to a large extent, you'll get agreement on specific agenda items. Okay, so people group themselves together under the banner of a political party because they share some common ideas. Now, <clears throat> once they've organized themselves into a political party, what are they gonna try to do? 
How are they going to get that trans? Remember, the bottom line is up here, right? At the top line. <laughs> the bottom line is the top line. Right? The bottom line is up here because what this this democratic model is suggesting that somehow public policy is supposed to be based on the views of these people down here once they form themselves into a majority coalition. But how do they get from there to here? Like, what's the intermediary step? Exactly. They organize themselves for the purposes of taking over and controlling government. And how do they take over and control government? By winning elections. And that's true in the United States, and that's true in every other democratic political system that we can mention and put up here on a list on the board. That's what political parties do, right? They organize individuals, but not that's not an end, okay? That's not the end game, right? Why do they organize individuals? Well, because they want to capture government. They want to take over and control government. And you're absolutely right. In a democratic political system, the mechanism for taking over and controlling government is winning elections. But again, that's really a means to an end. I, I think for a lot of Americans, when they think about the two dominant parties in the American system, they think that it ends right there. That all the Democrats are really concerned about is running government. And all the Republicans are really concerned about is running government. I think for many Americans, the cynical attitude about it, and I am as cynical as anyone, right? Um, I think for a lot of Americans, it ends right there. That's that's the end game. But really, is it? I mean, why do the Republicans want to control government? Why do the Democrats want to control government? What? To enact policies. Absolutely. It's a, they want policies that are enacted by government to reflect their philosophy and their ideas. So it is a substantive model, right? It's a substantively oriented model. Now, in the, I have other things on that along those lines I wanted to talk with you about, but in the interest of time, I'm going to just move on because time's going to slip away from us here real quick, okay? We might have to carry this over a little bit into Tuesday's class meeting, okay? Um, so let me let me begin this next part of the discussion by suggesting to you that distinction that was made by a French political scientist decades ago, Maurice Duverge, who identified two different types of party systems. The first is a cadre party system. Cadre party system is one that's dominated by political elites and is concerned with contesting the elections, but restricts the influence of outsiders non-elites are only useful in the extent that they help achieve the principal objective which is to contest the election a good example is the united states during the first party era which began really shortly after the ratification of the constitution but before the jacksonian era so like from the 17, late 1780s to the 1790s into the first decade or two of the 19th century, the 1800s, before the Jacksonian era, you had a party system in the United States. The first party system featured competition between the Federalist Party and the Jeffersonian Republican Party. They didn't call themselves the Jeffersonian Republicans. They just called themselves the Republicans. But I, I'm saying Jeffersonian Republican to distinguish that Republican Party from the Republican Party of today. It's not the Republican Party of today. In fact, it's really the origins of the modern Democratic Party. But more on that in just a minute. Okay? But that was a cadre party system. Ordinary citizens were not really in the equation. But it didn't take very long. Because by the 1820s, certainly by the 1830s, you had the emergence of a mass membership party system in the United States during that period that historians refer to as the Jacksonian era. For the first time, ordinary citizens are brought into the political process. They, they are, become part of the political process. But more generally, a mass membership party system is one that unites hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of followers, attempts to base itself on an appeal to the masses, which is clearly true of both the Democratic and Republican parties today. So 
So in the United States, this begins as early as the Jacksonian period through the 19th century. By the time we get to the 20th century, you have a number of democratizing innovations. We've already talked about one in this class, the direct primary. Remember we said the direct, in the previous week's class sessions, we talked about the direct primary being a innovation of the progressive reform movement. You had progressives in both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party who saw the direct primary as a way to take control of a very important party function, the nomination of candidates, take it away from the party bosses and democratize it, put it in the hands of the rank and file. So when Duverger or other political scientists talk about mass membership parties, they're really talking about the kinds of things that we think about today when we talk about political parties. So anyway, I'm going to skip over this because there's some other things I want to get to, make sure that we have a chance to get to. Uh, maybe we'll come back to that on Tuesday. Um, we're going to talk here in just a minute about the dominant two-party system in the United States. And that probably doesn't surprise any of you to hear me say that, right? But everybody recognizes that we have a dominant two-party system for the two dominant parties or the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. And it's been that way for a long time. But you should understand that the United States is, is you know, it's not literally the only country with a two-party system. To some extent, we might put Great Britain in that category, but it's kind of a modified two-party system. To a certain extent, Canada. But most of the other world's democracies, European countries, Asian countries, anywhere around the world where we find a country that we put on this list of democracies, they have competitive multi-party systems, not competitive two-party systems. So we'll talk a little bit about why that's the case, but let's initially make sure that everybody's clear on, I think, a very important point. We say that the United States has a dominant two-party system, and that is an accurate thing to say. I'm not about what I'm about to say to you doesn't undermine that. I think if you see a question on a test in this class or some other class that says, you know, the United States has a two-party system, dominant two-party system, and you answer true or, or, you know, answer the multiple choice question, you're pretty safe. And almost everybody who studies American politics would concede that we have a dominant two-party system. That doesn't mean we don't have other political parties. We do. But even if we just talk about the two dominant political parties, one of the things that I want you to understand is that it's the structure of both of the two major parties of the United States really mirrors the structure of government in our federal system. Just like we don't say that there's one government, it's kind of a point that we started with this semester, right? The, right out of the gate, right? We don't have just one government in the United States. We have one national government and 50 state governments, but we have literally tens of thousands of local governments, the county and municipal level and special district government level, right? Make up our federal system. It's exactly the same. The structure of the party system is exactly the same. We don't just have one Democratic Party. We have a national Democratic Party and we have 50 state Democratic parties and then we have literally tens of thousands of local Democratic parties organized at the precinct, the county level, or maybe the congressional district level, depending on what part of the country you're in. Right? And then the same thing in the Republican Party, one national Republican Party, 50 state Republican Party, literally tens of thousands of Republican parties at the local level. And it's worth noting that we have gone through periods in our history where this isn't all aligned, right? Like particularly at the national and state level. If we go back, for example, to the middle part of the 20th century, we're going to look at a Democrat, a, a national Democratic Party platform from the 1960s, and specifically look at the portions of that that platform that deal with racial equality and civil rights, and compare that to the Texas Democratic Party platform from the 1960s. You'd think we were talking about two completely different organizations, or the state Democratic Party, Mississippi state Democratic Party platform or Arkansas or, you know, any of, any of the other southern states on the question of civil rights. 
the state Democratic Party platforms in that era, arguing in favor of maintaining a system of segregation in the National Democratic Party platform, arguing for integration and greater racial equality. And I think today those differences are more likely to occur in the Republican Party, with the National Republican Party platform being decidedly more conservative than some state party platform. Not Texas, I don't think. I think the Texas Republican Party platform is probably pretty, pretty conservative, right? But other states where it might not be as conservative. Okay, so I just want you to be aware of that, that when we're talking about the two major parties in the United States, at least bear in mind that you have this sort of federal, the structure that mirrors the federal system with these different, you know, party organizations at different levels. All right, well, let's talk for the next few minutes about, well, we only got a couple of minutes, actually. Keep, this class ends at 1.30. I was thinking it ended at 1.40. All right, so let me just do the first one here real quick. <laughs> one explanation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through four, okay? And I'll have to carry this over to Tuesday's class meeting, okay? But let me just sort of set the table here by talking about the first one, okay? Why have we had a dominant two-party system? Why do we have a dominant two-party system in the United States? Whereas in Japan or Sweden or Germany or Italy or most other democracies around the world, you have multi-party systems. One explanation that's been offered for that is history or tradition. The argument is essentially we have a dominant two-party system in the United States because we've always had a dominant two-party system. And while it's true, we have always had a dominant two-party system, going back really to right after the Constitution was ratified, It's a pretty poor explanation, I tell you. All right, you understand what I'm saying? I'm, I'm going to say something. Don't go and repeat this to Professor Grubb or whoever your history professor is. I don't want to have to have an encounter with you. Okay? History doesn't explain anything. Or, to be more precise, the historical pattern doesn't explain the existence of the historical pattern. I have an economics background. Now, if one of you were to ask me, hey, Professor Fagan, why is it that gasoline prices tend to go up during the summer? And my answer to you is because historically they've gone up during the summer. You would probably never ask me another question again. That's no answer. <laughs> it's the same argument. We have a dominant two-party system because we historically had a dominant two-party system. That doesn't explain anything. Okay, why did we have a dominant two-party system from the beginning? Okay, it is true, right? You can just look at this little timeline here. You can see throughout the entire history of the United States, as I say, going back to just after the Constitution was ratified, we've always had dominant competition between two dominant parties. That doesn't mean we don't have other political parties. A lot, and by the way, this is not a complete list. I just, it's as many as I can put out there without it becoming too cluttered. <laughs> lots and lots. But why do we call them minor parties? Why do we call them third parties? Notice, by the way, that most of them pop up and then they go away almost as quickly as they pop up. Why, why do we call the American system a dominant two-party system when we have all these other political parties out there? Be specific. What it connects back to the purposes of political parties. What's the purpose of political party? Ultimately, but how do they get in a position to do that? They have to win elections. So the quick answer is we call it a dominant two party system because, for the most part, only two political parties can get their candidates elected to office, with just an exception here or there where a minor party does. Okay? All right. I will use the Tuesday class meeting to finish this up before moving on to the topic for next week. All right. Thanks for your attention. We'll see you next Thursday. Which, by the way, is our last class meeting before spring break. Okay.
but today is our last class meeting before um, your first core competency is due. So I'll you know, hang around here and try to wrap things, you know, shut everything down. If anybody has any questions they want to ask, 